Okay, so in this second part, uh, I will uh, talk about uh, perceptual test. Uh, I didn't know how many people would be joining later. So just uh, as a summary, because I could see uh, quite a few people have joined since the first talk. So uh, just repeat briefly what we have done with the six violins so everybody can follow. So it's a control set of violins with everything where everything was controlled from the choice of wood to the choice of fingerboards and bridges. We built six violin with everything as similar as possible, except a control change in thickness, either for the top or for the black, the back plate. So we have six violins with uh, always a one plate which is medium, and the other plane can be the other plate, so it can be thick, uh, medium, or or thin. And we have here this um, medium medium violin which has been built twice for control uh, reasons to see what is the differences between of all the little things we haven't been able to control and what are the differences due to the deliberate change in thickness. So just under an overview, we carefully chose the, the wood, uh, use the city scan and derive uh, something to feed the CNC so we could CNC route uh, the different plates, tops and backs, uh, they were then graduated, um, assembled, careful selection of fingerboards, bridges, the necks were routed as well, adjustment was done carefully, and uh, with this we ended up with six uh, Bele violins, because made at the Bele school in Bilbao, plus another six made by other makers who were interested and enthusiastic to take part in the project plus a last one, uh, Plowden, uh, which was made by Roberto as an outlier uh, to see whether the Plowden would be closer to um, Roberto's Uberman violin or would be closer to nothing, <laughs> would be avoided the outlier. So about the perceptual uh, test, uh, we basically conducted two series of playing and listening tests. The first one was in Bilbao in December 2018, which was basically just after the violin had been made. Uh, in that series of tests, we used the 13 violins I just mentioned. So the six belly violins, the six external violins, plus the Plowden. And another series of tests has been done in Oberlin in June 2019. And this time it was only the six belly violins because uh, all the violins, most of them had been uh, sold and uh, at least varnished. And then uh, due to a little mistake, they were, I specify this because it's actually changing a bit. Uh, they were without shoulder rest while they were mounted with shoulder rest during the Bilbao experiment. And uh, we can see the measurement that actually makes a, a bit of a difference to the shoulder rest. So, some of the differences could be due to the fact that Oberlin is, uh, it, it's that there's basically three sources of differences. The first is that it was six months later. So the violin could have you know, changed because it was the first six months of their life. There were no shoulder rest. And then uh, of course the climate was very different. And, and so, but um, still that's variability sources and uh, are they more important or less important than the differences in thickness that we can hear, uh, we will see. So um, I will first talk about similarities and dissimilarities between these violins uh, with a first experiment that was done in Bilbao as a, I would call it free categorization playing experiment. So it was a playing test. Um, people, uh, players came for individual sessions. Uh, of course, it was blind. Uh, and um, we call it free categorization. It means that they had to make groups of violins by similarity. The number of groups is not important. Uh, it was like really up to them. And, um, and the criteria for making these groups were up to them. So this is what I, I, I introduced this methodology in my talk on uh, Monday. So if you want to know more, you can uh, watch the YouTube video of that talk if you haven't listened to it yet. Um, the idea is like it's uh, very natural for people to make groups. Uh, that's how perception works. It's categorical. And so we, and here, 
there was like, of course, uh, some assumptions. We wanted to see whether the beta variants would stick out because they were made by the same group of people or whether some with the thin or thick thicknesses will stick out because they had like, they were a bit problematic. Uh, we want to see, for example, whether the Plowden would be put together with uh, Roberto's Huberman violin or not at all, or would be put together alone because it's a complete outlier. So there were plenty of um, things that we wanted to see uh, in, the, in the data. 21 players took the test. And so how do you analyze? Um, as I explained on, uh, on Monday, you, there are two ways of analyzing it. The first way is to actually look at the groups made by, uh, by the different players. And then the other way is to actually look at the verbal data that they use to describe each of the group. Um, there is a huge variability between players. So um, you can actually study how, if different groups of players uh, behave differently. And we actually identified two groups of players who had very different uh, strategies. So this is one group of players, seven players. And what is very striking is that uh, it actually, the tree that is obtained is actually uh, uh, correlates very well with the construction parameters. So, so how, do you, how you interpret such a tree? So basically, these trees represent the distance between two violins. And the distance is represented by the length of the branch joining two, um, two trees. So obviously, these two instruments here are quite close because the length is very short. This instrument is quite far from this one or quite far from this one because the length is, is very long. And what is interesting is we can see that we have the thin here, thin top, thin back. We have the thick, thick back, thick top here. And then we have uh, the two medium together, 11 and five. What I've done as well is based on the model analysis of uh, the external violins. I've tried to classify them between thin and thick, which it could be even thinner than the or thin violins or slightly towards medium or slightly less than medium. And so basically I've applied this um, categorization to, uh, to the, the purple violins, which are the external uh, violins. And so I can say, okay, V6 was actually a medium, like uh, five and 11. This one at the medium minus top, so slightly on the thin side. This one was medium as well. This one has a thin plus back. So uh, this one was uh, medium plus medium minus. And except for this one, which is on the thin side, all the medium are um, grouped together. So we already can see patterns here that the, as if the players were able to recognize some effect from the thickness. And the data organized very well uh, with construction parameters. And so you can see as well the Plowden is a bit on its own, but at the same time, the closest to which it is, is a six, which was actually the same maker, Roberto. So you can see the influence of the maker, even if it's uh, two different uh, models. So when I saw this first three, I was like very happy. I thought, well, once we have some perceptual data which correlate with, um, with um, um, perception. And I'm, I'm wondering, is it recording? Yes, it is, okay. Uh, and so we were very happy. But then, as I say, it's only seven players out of, um, out of 21. And so I looked at the other subgroup which had a similar strategy, that's only five players. And then here, it doesn't make any sense. Now, this time, we don't have the two mediums together, but they're actually quite far apart. We have the medium five here, the medium 11 here. The medium five has been put together with a thin back, uh, 13. And then the thin top is now here. Thick top, the thick back is actually with a thin back. So it's not more, it's maybe more something happening with the back, but the thick top is at the opposite. So, Yes, we were a bit like, okay, 
Um, so people disagree. They probably have like, uh, obviously when you judge a similarity between violins, you have to judge different parameters and you have to compromise, I mean, not compromise, but like take everything as a whole and weight the different parameters. And so the way you weight the different criteria may, may end up in a very different um, strategies in categorizing these uh, violins. Um, but here it's much uh, harder to actually correlate this with uh, the construction data. So, um, and then we looked, we thought, okay, because we have two different strategies in terms of what the players did. Now let's look at what they said about the violins to see whether this could inform us why, for example, the people here put the two mediums together while the people here put the medium, the two medium quite far apart. Unfortunately, we couldn't find anything. Um, the problem is first, they were a bit, um, uh, how do you say this? Like uh, they didn't talk that much. So they were, they only said a few things about each group, like just saying a few adjectives to describe each group. Each group. Uh, so they were not totally talkative. So we don't have that much information. In addition, because everybody is saying different things. Uh, in the end, it's very hard to see shared properties between the violins, and in particular shared properties that could actually differentiate one tree from the other tree. So that was really a, some disappointment because I was really hoping that the verbal data could um, help understanding why um, people had different strategies in terms of grouping the violins. But, uh, Maybe think well, maybe you know I don't know things that this the people on the left thought that these vines were this and this you know and then the people on the right saying oh they were more like that and that at least we could have uh, have like something to grab and try to pursue in further test but um, unfortunately there is nothing just people are just saying completely different things and we can't compare and they disagree so much that you find one person saying, oh, this, vine, this group of vine is round, and the next person will say that this group of the vine is, uh, is uh, bright vines, and then you, you can't just uh, compare. So that was for the playing test in um, Bilbao, and for similarities and dissimilarities. Um, we actually asked listeners as well. So I told you that we had some listening tests. And uh, so, we did a listening test in the nice uh, Bailey Auditorium. And we had 65 participants. And we actually, we wanted to investigate this a similarity in particularly between the two mediums, 11 and five, and five, but as well with 13, because when we actually had tried uh, the instrument just before the experiment, we were a bit surprised to see that the thin back actually shared some similarities with five and 11. So we thought, okay, let's test this uh, specific uh, triad. And, and so they were played uh, A, B, C, A, B, C. And um, listeners had to say which two of the three are most similar and which two are most dissimilar. So here are the results. Here you have the two violins that are most similar in a kind of white-ish, you have the pair 11 and 5, so the two medium-medium. Here you have 11 and 13, so medium and the thin back. And here you have the other medium and the thin back. And here you have the most dissimilar instrument. And uh, what I find quite interesting is like if you look at this here, which is actually significant in terms of like uh, Results. So that means that it's significantly different from equipartition. So it's not just like people just randomly chose uh, one pair out of the three. Um, it's different from equipartition. And what we can see is it actually makes sense with uh, what we could observe uh, based on the players' response. So 29 players put uh, 5 and 11. And that's actually what happened. Um, with subset one, where they had put five and 11 together. And then the other group is actually behaving like subset two, where it's actually five and 13 being put together. 
And so basically, you, we can see the same division among listeners that we had among players. You have people who think that it's 5 and 11 being closer together. And so people think that it's 5 and 13. We can explain as well this one here, although this one is not significant in terms of uh, equipartition. So it could have happened completely by chance. We cannot rule out that it hasn't happened by chance. But still, the result can be explained by the fact that both subset one and subset two actually considered 11 and 13 as being far apart. I'll, remind, I'll show you this. We have 11 and 13, which are far apart here. And we have 11 and 13, which are far apart here. OK, so basically, everybody thought that this one was uh, more apart. And, but subset one thought that 5 and 13 were far apart as well, because 5 is close to 11. Okay, so, so here we can see some um, coherence between the listening test and, and the playing test uh, for this uh, triad. We tried another triad, which was uh, 1, 4, and 11, uh, thick top and thick uh, back. Uh, unfortunately, the votes are distributed uh, by chance, uh, and, and there was just no way we could uh, put it in a link with, um, with the perception, with the um, construction or the perception of the, of, the, of the player. So this tested triad was maybe just because it was uh, more subtle, or I don't know. And then people just chose randomly, and then it's hard to, to interpret. So this was in Bilbao. We just mentioned that um, listening in that hall was extremely difficult. Like the, the size of the room and the type of players just made it so much harder to distinguish one violin from another. So it's quite remarkable that any of this came out. Yeah. And then we did the same in, uh, in Oberlin. So this time we had 40, 40, 45 participants. We did it in Kula's Hall for people who know it. Uh, so same triad, uh, same question. And again, this one was significantly different from equipartition. So whether it's similar to Bilbao in that sense, uh, because this, this one is clearly different from uh, equipartition, but this one isn't like in Bilbao. But what you can see is which pair has been, was chosen is very different between the two tests. So I put Bilbao again, the same pairs are in the same color. So yes, okay, you have 23, 23, but that's just the number which are the same by chance, but it was not the same number of participants. But you can see that the ratio of this one being chosen is much smaller here than it was here. This one was not much chosen. That's one and five, um, uh, 11 and, and five, while it was massively chosen in uh, Bilbao. So, so something, um, and that correlates with what, uh, uh, with what uh, Unai mentioned before, the fact that when we went to Bilbao, something with number five, which was actually pretty light in Bilbao, something had happened to it in uh, Oberlin because it was, as you will see later, less light and, and yeah. So I, I don't know if it's something has changed, is the climate uh, difference or something, somehow the structure has changed. Um, but definitely there are things which were not the same in Bilbao and in uh, Oberlin. Maybe the violins are just now in Bilbao and we can measure again. Um, are we, maybe we, we, we can see if they are really changed because of the structure or because of the weather whether differences from Oberlin to Bilbao. Yeah. And then uh, Marianne asked later if we can hear them. We, we want to record properly. I don't know if we will be able to do, but I would record recording with a good player and maybe they can be uploaded to the, to the cloud and, and take there to people to hear them in some place. Yeah, we, 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 you do record them. Uh, 
uh, you know, each player who came. Oh, yes, 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 and a scale and a, scale and a, yeah. and a, a little bit. And a yes. little excerpt, yeah. Yes, but but with, with a not very good, maybe recorder. Yeah. Yeah, we will try to record with some not, well better microphones and some some, some car. Mm. Okay, so that was about similarities and dissimilarities. Now I'm going to talk about global evaluations in terms of preference. So again, I will go through the different tests. So we had a plain test. Uh, so um, in Bilbao, after the categorization task, the 26 players had to choose their favorite violin among the 13. Uh, and so here we can see in this uh, line how many times each violin was chosen as a favorite. Uh, and in Oberlin, uh, I asked the participants, so 18, among whom there were 13 makers, to order the six violins uh, by, um, by uh, preference. And so for this, basically what I, I added, so I said, OK, arbitrarily, I gave six points to the first one, five points to the second one, and so on to one point to the last one. And I added the points for each violin. And that's what you can see in the second line. So we, um, we can see that in. It, there is some um, agreement because um, the two violins which were at least chosen once from the Bailey violins, which were 11 and 13, were the most uh, preferred violin in Oberlin. Okay, so, so there is some agreement there. Um, and of course, the other violin which were mainly chosen, especially in number six, they were from uh, there were the external violins, and these were not uh, used in Oberlin anymore. And here we cannot say because none of them had been chosen, so we can't really correlate this with what we observed in Oberlin. But at least the two violins, the two preferred violins from the six were the two preferred violins in Oberlin. And so that's why as well sometimes I feel like maybe they were not that different in Oberlin that they were in, in Bilbao. Um, so that was for the playing test. Now for the listening test in Bilbao, they had to rank each violin on a five star scale. And because we know that there is a massive effect of order and, uh, and um, Tim uh, nicely demonstrated it uh, in his talk, we decided to repeat the experiment at least twice with a different order for the violins. And to make it a bit more entertaining, we had an, another player. So of course, we don't know whether the difference is due to the player or to the order, but that's um, a limitation of, of the test. So ranking of the uh, rating of the all the violins on a five star scale, you can see that globally, especially with the error bars, that there is no massive differences. So I wouldn't be able to say, OK, this one is much better than this one. Overall, you can see that there were definitely violins which were preferred and violins which were less preferred. Uh, but uh, it's, it's quite difficult to, to run them, them. It's still a small difference on a scale from one to five. It's above three and below four. So it's not even it's like half a point difference on a one to five scale. So it's not a huge difference. But uh, still, what, what we can see is that the vine which are at the bottom, 941, 941, uh, and then five, they are the least preferred in Oberlin. Okay. And here, for player two, we have one, four, five, and nine at the bottom as well. Okay. So there is some consistency between the different tests, between the playing in Berlin, between the playing in Bilbao, between the listening in Bilbao, and then we will see as well uh, between the listening in uh, in Oberlin, where this time they had to uh, choose uh, their favorite by doing pairwise comparisons. Um, in, in Oberlin, we wanted to make the test shorter than in Bilbao because it's really too long in Bilbao. Uh, and we, yeah, because of the order effect, we stick to pairwise comparisons in Oberlin just because it gives more reliable results. And, and we only had six instruments, so it was easier as well to do pairwise because that's not so many pairs compared to when you have 13 instruments. And what you can see is 
here nine, which is uh, the thin top was massively preferred over the thick top. And that really corresponds to what the players thought. Here we have the thin back, which was massively preferred over the thick back. Um, and this is the case here. The thin back was preferred over the thick back. Here we have compared one and four. So the thick uh, back and the thick top, one being preferred to four, one being preferred to four. And here we have 13 being preferred to nine and 13 being preferred to nine. So the listeners do agree with what the players uh, thought when playing the test. And that, I think that's probably the first time I see agreement between the players and the listeners. So that's really, that's really nice to see. So there are different, def definitely, and especially like here, you can maybe argue that, okay, it could be almost you by chance where some people chose one, some people chose the other one. Here, that's definitely not the case. There is a very massive differences between the two values and people are, are clearly had a preference for one, uh, which is the thin. They prefer the thin top over the thick and they prefer the thin back over the thick back. Okay, uh, so that was about global evaluation in terms of preference. Now, if we can go a bit into more details about sound quality and, and power. So, in, uh, so that's the listening test in uh, Bilbao. Uh, we evaluated pairs and they had to, uh, to, to say which one has a better tone quality in the low register and which one is more powerful overall. There are two answer of the question, but I don't have the time to show you all the results. And because there was the same question about the high register, there was a question about the balance across strings. Um, so different questions. So um, here we have uh, thin top versus thick top. And um, so we know why it was preferred. It's because definitely it has a better tone quality by far. Same for the thin back versus the thick back. It was obviously preferred because the thin back was much preferred for, it was much, uh, it was considered to have a much better tone quality. In addition, uh, the thin back is more powerful. Uh, so better sound quality and more powerful, no doubt that it was preferred. Uh, it's also well to see that it's not the case for all pairs. Not all pairs had big differences. And you had some pairs as well, which were very close and, and surprisingly, the pair where we compared five and 11, which are supposed to be uh, identical, you know, uh, yes, uh, they couldn't say which one was more powerful. In Oberlin, uh, this time they had to rate, uh, so they were comparing the violins by pair, but uh, had to rate each violin inside the pair on a one uh, to uh, five. Uh, so one pool, five excellent uh, scale. And um, it's interesting to see that the agreement is there as well. So here, if we compare the thin top and the thick top in uh, Bilbao, they said that the thin top was better in terms of tone quality. Here we see as well that no doubt that uh, nine was weighted as much better than, than four. Here it's a thick back, thin back. Uh, we can compare it to here. Here, the thin back 13 was uh, again, much preferred. And here we can see that there is no overlap. So that's a confidence interval. There is no overlap between the two. So it was a clear preference for uh, 13. Um, that's for uh, the power. We can see it as well. Um, here uh, it corresponds, and then here, here actually there, there were some difference here, which we didn't see in, uh, in, in Bilbao. But uh, globally, you can see that uh, the results are, are quite coherent between the two tests, even if they were done slightly different, slightly differently. And then I will finish about uh, recognition or like identification for people who don't know these violins, uh, which is something we, uh, we find it uh, interesting for, for violin makers. It's like, can these violins be either identified if it's your first um, exposure to them or recognized if you have already listened to them uh, in blind test? 
So in Oberlin, we did um, during the blind te playing test I told you about, where they had to uh, rank them by order of preference. I actually asked the participants who were makers as well, so there were 13 of them, to identify which vine was which. So basically, I said, okay, these are the six violins. One has a thin top and a medium uh, back, one has a thin, uh, thin back and a medium top. So I told them which were the six violins, and they have to say, okay, this is the one with the thin top, and this is the medium, and this is, yeah. Um, so that was one test. Uh, in Villefavar, last year, we worked quite a lot on these violins. And so we did a blind listening test uh, with 16 listeners. And um, we did it this time, we did it quite informally, uh, but I think it's interesting to, to put the results. We had to say whether both plates were medium or whether one plate was either thick or thin. Okay, so it was not a fully uh, identification test. We, we couldn't, we, we didn't have to say, okay, this one is this one or this one. We just had to say whether we felt like one plate was thin or thick or both were medium. And then uh, in Oberlin, during the blind uh, listening test um, with pairwise comparisons, we actually asked the maker as well uh, to say which one has a thicker top or a thicker back. So here are the results. The six violins, uh, I'll remind you what they are. So top, back. So the correct guesses in, in Oberlin, so I told you there were 13 players uh, who were actually uh, makers. And we can see that out of 13, five was only recognized seven times. The other medium was recognized seven times, uh, 12 times for the thick top, seven times for the thin top, uh, six times for the thick back, and three times for the thin. I put in red the numbers which are above chance, so that we can say that clearly there we are recognized. So the thick top, the thin top, and the thick back. This one here is actually uh, almost above chance, it's not far from it. Uh, but the other two, no. Then these are the guesses in uh, Villefavar, and here we can see that actually only the thick back and the thin back were not uh, clearly uh, correctly identified uh, above chance, but the other four values were identified. So people were able to spot the two medium ones and they were able to spot either the thick top or the thin top. And then uh, Oberlin in the listening test, uh, we asked you know, which one has a thicker top between nine and four and massively uh, people got it right saying it was uh, number four. And then for the thick back, uh, you can see that was much harder. So this is uh, just uh, chance. And it's not surprising because this is what we observe here as well. You know, here uh, the thin, um, thin or thicker back, thin back was not spotted and here people couldn't tell them apart. Uh, so, so again, uh, some coherence between the different uh, tests in terms of what people can uh, recognize based on the construction parameters. Um, I'd like to finish the talk with uh, talking about some radiation and measurement and how we can use them with, uh, within this recognition and identification task. So, so, so far, uh, I feel like it has been quite difficult to find solid correlations between sound radiation measurements and, and perception. And uh, I'll remind you the, how these measurements are done. So usually uh, we do a series of measurements. We excite the bridge with a little hammer. We can excite what we call horizontally or we can excite vertically. Um, and we move the microphone around the violin and measure at different positions. So usually 10 or 12 positions. So at the end, we have 20 or 24 measurements. And so far, uh, the program by default was calculating the RMS average of these uh, measurements and which was plotted as a function of frequency. And here I put a graph for the two medium uh, violins. However, I, I feel like this average was like maybe not the most uh, meaningful thing and started questioning it, especially uh, because of the fact that if you think about it, uh, when you excite the violin and, and especially like, for example, on the G string, 
you, you come with an angle, which is like about around 30 degrees. So you excite an angle. So you can imagine that if you project the force onto vertical and horizontal um, directions, you have an angle. And we should take into account this angle when, uh, when doing the, the measurement. So I don't want to go into the details here because it's a bit complicated for, for the audience. But basically, I decided to use this angle and and do um, and try different angles and see what uh, it could do, and to actually select a method that I find it uh, perceptually relevant. I decided to decided to synthesize the sounds as I explained in my previous talks. So for people who were not um, here in the previous talks, we actually reproduce uh, digitally how. A violin works. So what you have is you have the bowed force, and you can measure the bowed um, the force on the bridge implied caused by the vibrating string with little piezos. Uh, that was a photo from uh, Jim's uh, lab, and here is um, the sound. Okay, and what happens is that this force here is actually filtered through the response of the body, which uh, here we will use the uh, radiation measurement. And then you can synthesize an output. And so I could test different ways of processing the radiation measurements by actually uh, synthesizing different sounds and see whether some would capture better uh, the real prop the properties of the real violins. So, um, so I actually synthesize the six Bilbao violins. And because I have, uh, I'm privileged to work with a nice group of people in Villefavar who know the violins quite well, I've sent the, the files to them and said, okay, please, can you take the test and identify the different violins? Can you recognize? Because over the years now, um, many people have actually, I mean, a few people, I would say, have actually listened to the violins in Bilbao, some in Oberlin, then in Villefavar. In Villefavar, we did a lot of testing with them. And so some of uh, people actually have quite a lot of notes of each violin and have start having some idea about the different violins. And so I thought they were, a very good group of people to try to test whether some of the properties that you can hear when you compare these different sound synthesis, um, whether they actually capture some properties of the real violins. So I synthesized something rather long to have the low register and a bit of the higher register. So for the sake of, uh, of this presentation, I'm not going to play you all the long recordings, but I can play you a shorter version of each recording. So you can start seeing a bit some differences between the violins. So try to think whether you can recognize which one is which. Can you hear some differences? Mm -hmm. 
negligible. <laughs> so that was a thin back, thick top, medium, thin top, thick back, medium. And so, well, the results are amazing. And I'm so happy to say this because they are amazing. Nine out of 13 participants were well above chance with five who actually got six correct answers. And the probability of having it correct by chance is one over 720. So we can definitely say that they did it better than chance, much better. And four got four correct answers. Um, and, and all the findings were actually recognized uh, well, 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 well above chance. So um, I feel like this new method for processing sound radiation measurements seems to be relevant because if people were able to identify the variant, it means that they were able to feel some properties that they associated uh, with the real variant. And, um, and then uh, we can see as well that makers can be trained to hear specific problems other things being equal. Uh, so here that would be a problem with the thickness being either too thick or too thin, because a group of people here uh, is a group of people who actually used the Bilbao violins for a little while. I've listened to them quite a few times. Um, it would actually be, so here I only tried one angle um, and I would like to try different angles to see whether we can even improve this or not. And I think it could be interesting as well to synthesize this with uh, Colin's internal uh, microphone measurements to see how much uh, from the internal microphone measurement is captured uh, in terms of relative differences. So I'm not talking about absolute properties, but more in terms of relative differences in terms of like, you know, the low frequency content or the high frequency content. So, um, but this is really just a new investigation for the last, um, a uh, few months so okay uh, time to conclude so i think one of the main difficulties of, of this uh, perceptual testing is the fact that how can we get reliable information on the sound and playing qualities of different instruments of the same family so like here different violins in order to relate them to acoustical and construction parameters when if you think about it, differences are overly uh, um, uh, quite subtle and multidimensional and players and listeners disagree so much. So we have two complexities. If we have overall small differences, because uh, still, if you think about it, uh, nothing sounds more like a violin than another violin. So it's overall quite certain differences. And you know, on the other hand, you have people who disagree, completely disagree. And so, finding a good way to actually get robust and reliable information is really difficult. And if you present, um, for example, I wanted to do the categorization task because this is what is more supposed to be the most natural for, for people, but then people actually found it pretty hard. And uh, we didn't really find any clear conclusions at least about the description of the groups. And because people very like disagree and the task was difficult. And if you compare by pairs, it seems to be easier, but then we have uh, the problems and when actually people will behave a bit differently when they just compare pairs and when they actually have a bigger range of violins. And this is known as like uh, similar to the problem known as joint versus separate evaluations. And, and I mentioned this a bit um, Yesterday, with you know the example of uh, like if you want to go buy something in a shop, you compare two different things or many different things, and you end up trying to choose between two, and you choose one for some reasons, and when you arrive home, you feel like the reason why you chose this one was not the most appropriate because in the end you don't remember that it's so much uh, it's not as good as the other, and so. When you compare, you are you pay more attention to very subtle details that, when you don't compare, may not actually be that relevant. And and, and so um, and so comparing by pairs have some advantage because it's easier. But then you make artificially people aware of some details that, when they actually judge in a more global way, wouldn't really matter. 
However, having said that, I think uh, if we look at all the tests about these variants, we, we start having some idea of what these variants are and what are the different uh, perceptual differences between these variants and which result clearly from construction differences and that makers can actually learn and train to recognize. So in terms of timbre, at least for this arching outline, you know, it's better to be on the thin side than on the thick side. That's pretty clear. The thick instruments were really not light. And having the correct thickness is more important for the top than the back, because we could see that the thin back was actually pretty light, um, but the thin top, not so much. And, um, and definitely the thick back was really, really not, uh, clearly not working properly. Uh, the faults uh, in the sound or the playing properties due to the wrong thickness cannot be compensated by adjustment. And this is something I haven't really shown in this presentation. Just wanted to mention it briefly in the conclusion because it's something we did with the Villefar group last year is like the project was actually to, to work on the violins, on the four violins with thicknesses problems and to uh, ask, uh, so our, I allocated one violin to uh, a group of three makers. So we had three gro four groups of uh, three makers and the task for during the week was to actually modify the setup. So bridge and sound post to improve the instrument. So we did listening and playing test before at the beginning of the week. And then we did listening and playing test at the end of the week. And overall, we realized that the quality of the instrument was still recognizable despite having been improved. And to be honest, some violins where we actually, it was easy to reverse back. So we heard it, we said, oh yes, some people heard a better an improvement, some people not. And when we reversed it back to the original state, it was actually not that clear that it had improved. So it has been very challenging to actually really improve this instrument just by modifying the setup. So there is something, if you have the thickness wrong, it's very hard to compensate for it afterwards. And something that we have already discussed at the end of the previous talk is that these instruments are an amazing, amazing educational tool uh, because we do really believe now after all this testing that there is something in the construction, at least other things being equal, that you can learn to uh, recognize and could be useful uh, for future uh, making and diagnosis of uh, problems. Thank you for your attention. There are some uh, some questions. Um, first, uh, Jason asked, but George already uh, answered the question: If the M two and M five and the graduations will be published somewhere, and George said that uh, they would be eventually. Uh, and then Rob also asked uh, if the sound fragments will be available somewhere in good quality, because he would like to play with them himself. Yes. Yeah. So, so yes, so, so sound files I can I can share them yes and but and the, what what they wanted me to share at the beginning, what was the beginning of the question? Um, the the I think the M two and M five the plate um, the tap tones and the thickness profile that was used on the violins. Okay, so this uh, I, I mean everything would be available in due course for sure. Um, but uh, I don't know to which extent things will be shared now before it's published or after. But uh, yes, the, the idea is that it's uh, an ed educational program. So, so yes, uh, it is meant to be available. The, sorry, the, the thicknesses of the plates are in our web page. If you go to B, bele.es, but B E L E. That is. That if, if you, yeah. Unai, maybe you could uh, type it in the we chat. We, yes, but we can I don't know why, but the the keyboard is blocked, and I cannot ah. write nothing. <laughs> I, okay. Anything. But Bele dot es because of uh, España. So. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> if you type uh, Belle Bilbao project, you will find the web page. Uh -huh. And there is a, uh, it's called Construyendo Tapas y Pombas. Okay, Tim, Tim has uh, oh. sent it, so. Oh, yeah, yes. Tim sent it. Yes. Uh, no, no, not in the intro part. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. It, I don't know why, sometimes it's, a, it's, it's in another entrance, not in that one, anyway, but if you mess around, you find the entrance where there is, there are the, the Bilbao Kiss School effect. <laughs> what? Yes, if, if you go in the web page, they, you will find the, okay. the results. Some, some results, oh. not all of them. We, we will publish uh, the big paper. You will. Yes, we have to. Hans, you wanted to ask a question? Um, um, can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to, I have a very serious comment on not only this talk, but all of your work. And I think the correct English adjective is freaking amazing. <laughs> I just thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> Dimitri? Uh, yes, thank you very much for your presentation and for your work. It's really impressive. I'm very curious and can't wait to see the plate modes and the, and the body modes and to hear the sounds, how they differ, to try to figure out some something from it. My question was, uh, like at first, when people had to tell which violins were more powerful, they preferred the violin with a thin back. But then when you had uh, them to choose which violin had a thin and which violin had a thick back, we have the split 50-50, so they couldn't tell mm. which is thin, which is thick. So was, did it happen because they heard that the sound is different, but they couldn't tell why it's different? Yeah, yeah, uh, but... Um... Exactly. Uh, and I think that's uh, part of the training that can be offered with such a, with such a tool because, uh, because the, the, the people from Vilfava are now able to do it, uh, almost even on sound synthesis, which, as you could hear, doesn't really sound like a real violin. And still, uh, many could actually tell them apart. So there is really something, I think, with, uh, yeah, where you could actually train. There is obviously about the thick top. I think there is obviously an experience that you all have, um, because even in the um, playing test with makers, you know, most makers got it right. So I think that you have this sense without really training, just by experience, you have, uh, you have, you know this. For more subtle differences, uh, I think uh, you could gain it by, by, by learning it. Uh, by yeah, but you only can do this if. That's the only thing which is different. You can't do it if you know everything is different. And that's why uh, I really can't thank enough uh, Unai and the Belly School for this opportunity to create a, an amazing educational tool, which we, we really believe uh, uh, has uh, some value um, for, for you. Uh, okay. because, um, I think, I mean, we will have a one table after that where some makers will. Uh, um, We'll talk about what they have learned and you know but i think some of them said because now they can recognize that something that they can more easily diagnose in an instrument where they they feel a bit like something in the in the uh, at the bottom of the instrument they felt like ah actually this is, could be because it's too thin uh so it um but i don't want to talk uh, at, at their place you know make us you know what you have to do and know how to do it you know i don't really want to give advice or whatever, but I had the feeling that it was useful for as a learning experience to uh, improve some of the values where you are not fully satisfied, but you don't really know what has been wrong. And it's in an, another tool. Among all the tools you have, it could be another tool of, of, of improving. Yep, thank you. I can imagine, uh, Claudia, like listening two or three times a day to those um, synthesized sounds just to have them in the background twice a day. You could, you could sort of learn to distinguish them that way. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, if we are convinced that this synthesis is relevant, then yes, it, it could be a way because then obviously the Bilbao violins, you have to be lucky enough to go to Bilbao, but it's worth a trip. It's a beautiful city. The, the people there like Unai and all the team will are lovely and great hospitality. <laughs> the food is amazing. So I, you know, don't go just there for the violins. <laughs> you really should go anyway. Uh, but, um, but, uh, so yeah, so if indeed the synthesis proves to be to be a good tool, then that means that would make it even more accessible. So we could provide the recordings, real recordings with different players, and we could provide um, this, this to, uh, sound as well. And um, well, the advantage of the synthesized sounds is like, despite them being a bit artificial, uh, you are sure that it's the same player. I mean, the same playing. And so what you compare is only differences in the instruments. There are some questions in chat again. Yes. Um, Harris uh, said, there is currently some time since you have made those violins. Do you know it by now, uh, the different environmental or playing conditions, have they changed their acoustic behavior even slightly? Over time. I think, yes. Yeah, so I mean, what was one of the big surprise, and I mean, uh, George and Roberto Unai, tell me if I'm wrong, is like, I think what was the surprise is in Ville Favar, uh, last year when we started working on the violins, uh, the idea was as well that probably they needed some adjustment, even the medium violins, because they had been done, made by, by uh, um, a year before, you know. And so, and I think people were surprised to see that actually the sound post was not that bad. And usually I know that makers, you actually make a new sound post after a few months because it has a, um, it's too short. And we didn't notice it. So we were wondering whether it's because they are unvarnished or I don't know, um, but that, was, that had been a surprise that they actually didn't really need that much adjustment compared to what could have been expected. Now, between Oberlin and, and Bilbao, the things have a bit changed, yeah, it seems so. At the same time, I feel like if you look, I would say locally at some differences, there are some differences, but globally, the picture stays the same in terms of what people were able to recognize and, and, and tell apart. So, so yeah. Um, but there are still, Still, one point I haven't really emphasized because I'm struggling with this is the fact that, and especially in, um, a, I didn't really put emphasis on it, but if you look clear, clearly in the in in the Oberlin playing test, the, number five was really not liked that much, and number eleven was among the favorites, and they are supposed to be the same violins, and the radiation measurements are very similar, and everything is very similar. So there are still something puzzling there, is how come two instruments which have been made, I don't think you can find two instruments which are closer than these two on the planet. And, and despite this, uh, one was liked and one was disliked. And that's really, really puzzling, really puzzling. Claudia, could I just cut in, because our six David Rubio violins, um, yeah. Um, in among those, he made two as similar as he could, and we had exactly the same experience. They, they do come out pretty similar, but players can tell them apart and have a very firm preference for one rather than the other. Yeah. We've never got to the bottom of what exactly it is that's different. They're still hanging on my wall downstairs. They were in the background of my talk. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is a project like um, uh, that... Um, Jim had with, with a violin maker in Cambridge where they made six violins, uh, where the plates were tuned different uh, tuning uh, rules. Yeah, other things rather similar to yours. He chose yeah. six, but, six adjacent but, backs from the same log, six adjacent tops from the same exactly. log. Um, and, he had and then, being router, so they were all the same arching, uh, yeah. And then, but what we, everybody was agreeing is that the fact that even if they were, the plates had been tuned so very different uh, ways, overall, they were still sounding quite similar. And that's because I had this in mind that I suggested for the Bilbao project that we should not have only the six Bilbao violins, but we should have external violins as well to increase the range of, of differences. 
Absolutely. And there are people here who played ours. Colin has played them. Yeah. George has seen them. But yes, the people tended to comment. They all sound quite like Rubio's, which was yeah. <laughs> good in a way, you know, because they'd all been made on the same model and set up by the same maker and so on. Yeah. Uh, Jim, are the, the two Rubio's that are uh, very similar in measurement, are they consistently liked or disliked by people? Fairly consistent. I mean, insofar as players are ever consistent, there, there, there is a there, there, there is a clear preference for one rather than the other. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the supposedly matched pair was quite a lot of players chose that out of the six as their favourite one, uh, and no one ever chose the other one from the matched pair. Um, yeah. Uh, that's another story, but uh, no, absolutely. Maybe we go back to the questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, Hannah asks, so looking at the average response is not good to correlate with perception. Any considerations for some kind of a binaural frequency response to help match perception? Question mark. No, no, no. I, I'm not saying it was not good for perception. It's like, I mean, I, I found it, we found it difficult uh, to actually relate the measurements with the perception. And, 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 you know, I mean, Anna who was there in Ghent, you know, we have done six, some experiments where we, you know, we measured the violin, we did some modification, measured it after, uh, we could see differences in the radiation measurement, but it was quite hard to know why we heard it differently and why, you know, so, and so I thought, well, if we always look at this measurement, then we should better understand it. And then I started working on this with my PhD student, Timothy Warford, and and we thought, okay, can we use better advantage of this, the fact that we measure vertically and horizontally and that we actually play with an angle. And so I decided to look into this a bit more and, and, and thought that the RMS thing was not really good and then had uh, talks with George and, and Jim in the last past months about this. And, and then I thought, okay, because we have this synthesis tool then let's use it to actually find the best way to combine these processed measurements. About the synthesis tool, there are also some questions. Yeah, Justin wants to know more. Yes, Justin and uh, Jason also. Jason asked, is the synthesis, synthesis possible for us to do with available software? Uh, yeah, with available software, like free software, uh, yes, because it's just a filtering and I think you have a free version of MATLAB like called Octave or something like this. So yes, possibly do it. Yeah. What, I wanted, what I wanted to know, is there a way that we can uh, load an FFT plot into an equalizer and then move that around and then play a signal through? All I, all I want to do is get an FFT plot into a, uh, an equalizer. Does anybody know if that's... Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if you, because then you have to to some say convolution using in Audacity. Well, I can, I can okay, maybe it you can do it in Audacity. I should investigate this. Anders is, uh, is saying that apparently you can do, because it's a convolution of the bowing response and um, the measurement. Right, but I get like I get an FFT plot. Well, I guess I could get an FFT plot in Audacity through Audacity. Okay. okay. Uh, so, so, ba so basically, is uh, if I want to tell you more about how I do it, is like I take into account the fact that the force you apply on the bridge is neither horizontal nor vertical, but is with an angle, and so I project the force on with an angle, so cos alpha on the horizontal axis plus sinus alpha on the vertical axis. And so I combine the vertical taps and the horizontal taps with this cos and sinus. And because it, they are complex numbers, then uh, you get some cancellations and everything. So just instead of squaring all the measurements, like uh, summing all the measurements squared and then taking the square root of this, I actually use a cos alpha and sinus alpha and do the complex average at the end. Could I just come back on the previous point about equalizers? 
Um, I think it would not be easy to do a good job of the equivalent thing Claudia was showing with an equalizer because among other things, the, the response that we're putting into this filter is matching the individual low body modes, including their damping factors. Now, no equalizer has, will, will let you <laughs> control the damping subtly enough to do that. So it needs to be done in software rather than an equalizer as such. Okay, so just shifting B1 minus down in amplitude of frequency, it wouldn't be correlative to what it would do if you actually made that change to the body of the instrument. Well, it, you can say so you can do that in, in software using the correct Q factor for B1 minus and then shifting it, but your equalizer will have a Q factor which is what's governed by the, the manufacturer rather than something you can control. It's then- And then- Basically, it equalizer it can't shift frequencies. It can't shift frequencies of modes. It can only change- No, no, you know, an equalizer, you, 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 could, you could build a peak in an equalizer and build it in a different place. A very um, fine it won't be the right kind of peak. It won't have the yeah. correct transient response and it, it won't sound yes. right. Won't we'll make the clunk noises properly if for people who were listening the other day. <laughs> I think it's actually quite difficult to do what he, what he, I think it is that he wants to do. But we did do some of that in the past, where we actually did modal analysis on a on a spectrum like a, an admittance, and we we can then represent it as a collection of modes, which we can then edit individually. We can change no, their absolutely. frequencies, amplitudes, and damping and, factors. But that's quite a complicated task. Yeah, not, my not banjo noises available. I was playing on my software. software. Yeah, using my yeah. software, you can do that, but you have to have to make the correct analysis of the spectrum in the first place, which uh, which is never possible. And you can't do it on radiation measurements? No. 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 Not, not, not really, no. On radiation. <laughs> yeah. You can't do modal analysis on radiation measurements. Yeah. That, that's the general rule. You might get away with it up to a crude level, but it, it's the, the assumption of modal analysis does not apply to a microphone measurement. So you're fitting apples with oranges. Tim, have you seen any other question? Um, yeah, yes, Marty uh, asks the questions, do the impedance calculations done with the free plates and then with the George's method with the pinned edges, uh, do they show the same trends or not? Hang on. No, but Unai has looked at this more than I have, so he's, uh, he's, he's come up with a number um, from the plate weights and, and modes of the pinned edge frequencies, so I think Unai should talk about that. Yes, yes. Uh, more or less, yes, but uh, we saw some differences. Uh, for example, I, I can share this 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 data in somewhere maybe in our web page uh, we, we did the we we tried to to did to do the, the same plates the, the medium ones the the pliant ones uh, with the set evans number for the top ones uh, 40 and for the bugs the medium were 60 with the with the pin that rig we did more or less the same thing, uh, a kind of uh, George uh, said George number, uh, multiplying the mass <laughs> by by the frequency itself of the first uh, pin that uh, mode. And m most of them were quite reliable, more or less the, the medium ones has, for example, this this George said your number uh, 26, 26.5, 27, the, the pliant one 21, and the rigid one uh, 32, this correlation. But we, we found we found something curious in, in one back plate. The, the medium set Evans were 60, for example, and one of the back plates really had a uh, Quite low this pin edge mode. Then the, the even if they looked very similar, one of them was uh, not not very similar. Maybe easier to bend, and was one of the medium ones in the ES Violin Four. 
more we didn't understand that did we more similar to the to the pliant one the, the pin edge not, not the the two and five modes uh, this set Evans number were was similar to the mediums ones 60 but if the medium medium ones have 55 this uh, pin edge number set numbers the other was 80 88 no 48 sorry too close to the to the 44 that has the the pliant back pin edge number then yeah and we didn't we didn't measure this but there was one of one of them maybe for another if, if we do another project we will take care for maybe this this pin edge frequencies also Dimitri has a question. No, thank you, Tim. I guess uh, that's the hand from my older question still there for some reason. Well, because I didn't remove it. <laughs> Usually I'm in charge of doing this. Is there more questions or is it? Could I ask one question? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to to figure out the, uh, which was the preferred solution there for those instruments. Was it the the low, the thin top, and the medium back, or no? Definitely the thin and the thick top. Definitely not. Okay. But it was the preferred in in Oberlin by very many players. No, the the thin back and the medium one. Okay. The preferred were the eleven, which is medium medium, and thirteen, which is the thin back. Okay. So that's why my conclusion was like for the top, it quite matters. So we haven't seen any evidence that the thin top and the thin and the thin top and the thick back were liked. For the for the back. It matters less, but it matters more if it's uh, it's better if it's thin than thick. Mm. But with a thin top, they were able to distinguish it as a more bassy instrument or something like that. Yeah, very boomy. Yeah, more boomy. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. I'm looking forward to the articles in a year or two. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the thin, the thin back was also a very good violin, more equilibrated than the thin top. Yeah. More similar. So, I don't know if, if this is could be a good idea or not, but the, the thin, yeah, more or less the the set even numbers of the medium tops were forty and the back sixty. If okay. the back is has this set number a little more closer to the top, mm. maybe it will work better. I don't know if it's reasonable or not. Mm. But, but it's uh, true in, that the two medium ones were the most preferred violins, most equilibrated okay. and more. Okay. And, and what what is the medium uh, thickness then? Is it the thickness that uh, belongs to that uh, model and instrument? Ah, uh, why well, I have not seen it. Or is it something different? I mean, medium would be what you consider as standard, yeah? What's called medium because that would be the medium for the back. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a lot of statistics on, on uh, all the instruments yeah. thickness <laughs> gathered together and uh, I would just two point, two two point four millimeter in average is uh, I guess is uh, is uh, quite uh, average for a Stradivari top, so it would be something like that I guess. Uh, Anders, you can find that in the in the web page. Uh, yes. Okay. Medium, yes. Medium. Focus. Okay. So so that's the pictures there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Those pictures. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. 
is three point. Um, Dennis, it was uh, the formula I gave the formula in one of the slides for uh, calculating uh, the events um, the events number. Do you want me to put it on the project it again, or do you just you can Google it, or I can send it to you by email, or you can watch the video again. Claudia, can I just ask you a quick question in the meantime? Yes. Uh, when, when you did your synthesized sounds, you had a picture on your slide of a, an, an, an instrument in an anechoic chamber, but you didn't yes. do those measurements in an anechoic chamber. No, no, because basically, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, the instrument is Tim's instrument, and this was during a session in my anechoic home in my lab. Um, but uh, no, at Belize, they don't have, and there was no time to bring the instrument to Paris. And okay, thanks. So the disadvantage of not doing it in a, in a, in a, an anechoic chamber is like if you listen to it, you basically kind of get double room acoustics, but. Yeah, yeah. And you have, it's a bit more noisy in a non- uh, uh, mm -hmm. call, uh, Which we try to, to do the, the, those. Yeah. Uh, th those those uh, yes, uh, measurements we try to do in a very asymmetric room and we, we try to cover with those absorbent panels, those right. pyramid panels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course it, it was not the ideal. Room. Yeah. Okay. There is one question about the Iberman Strad. Well, it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's Georgia's bell uh, violin. So ask him if he thinks it's good or not. <laughs> Mostly, I, I think Joshua Bell makes a very good sound. I really like his violin sound. But um, I think some people might think as a model the Hoover Woman isn't the most obviously soloistic model to work from because I say the archings are, are slightly lower efficiency than some other strad models in a sense in that, that, that you don't get uh, you get lower frequencies for your plate weights and that's quite good for instruments that have got a lot of depth and solidity to the sound but not so good for instruments with the extended brilliance but I, I think it's not a bad model but it's not mo I mean it's not the most mainstream typical Strad model in some ways. And if I can add something, um, you know, there are quite a, a few respected makers who actually took the test in Oberlin where they played all the instruments and quite a few uh, said that the violins were overall very good and some were really could be really called as uh, professional violins. So uh, just so to reflect that, uh, to even if you know uh, the work has been done as well at Belay by students and everything, everything has been really like very carefully made and with a lot of talent from the team. And, and so even even if some violins had some um, problems because of deliberate problems because of sickness being too thick, or uh, still some of them were more in the medium range were considered as really good and of professional value. So we can really clap for the ballet team and George and Roberto and because they have done quite amazing instruments. Dennis also has a practical question uh, about putting the, uh, the Z uh, calculation into practice if somebody has maybe an excel or a spreadsheet where the formula is inside so makers can just easily use it we can i can share it if that's no problem that's something i have to put in the folder that i will share with you or oh, jim has shared something maybe jim is sharing it right now Okay, maybe it's time to finish this and unless you really want it. 
Let me just tell you about the file that I've sent in the chat. Yes. Nothing to do with the current discussion, but earlier on, <laughs> someone wondered what whether we knew where the morale violins had gone. Ah. So if you just open that photograph, just possibly, that's a picture that I took in Stockholm when Eric Janssen had to move lab. And it should be a box full of bits of violins <laughs> left over from decades of experimenting in Eric's lab. Um, that's, the, that's the sort of place they might have ended up. <laughs> <laughs> So, do you think so you think that the the plates might uh, exist uh, as they were during the experiments or the instruments i think everything got lost in that if they existed before the the stockholm group moved building then i think they got lost at that stage because eric retired at roughly the same time and he didn't keep he chucked out all sorts of old stuff all his no he had decades of lab notebooks and things and um, so I strongly suspect they don't exist anymore. <laughs>